Hi, and welcome to Something to Talk About. I'm Linda McNamee, and for the next hour, we are going to discuss what exactly is celiac disease. And there's a lot I don't know, so I'm guessing that there's a lot you don't know. So hopefully you will find it as informative and as enlightening as I hope to. But before we begin, we have to take care of a few little housekeeping rules. If you would like to speak with our wonderful guest, whom you will meet momentarily, you can always give us a call at 781-270-9199. Or if you think of a suggestion for a future topic or would like to see our guest again, I love getting feedback via email, you can always email me at talk at bcattv.org. I would like to thank the crew for this evening Chris Flaherty, staff member here, is always making sure that everything runs smoothly. So thank you, Chris, for helping us out once again. And we also have a couple of volunteers tonight, Colleen Moore and Jolie Atwood, who come faithfully every Wednesday to come and help me out. So I really appreciate their helping me as well. And of course, we want to thank my husband, Paul, for staying home for Daddy Date Night. Hopefully, the kids will not give you too much of a hassle. Housekeeping aside, I think that's everything and now I would like to introduce my wonderful guest for this evening, Dr. Jocelyn Sylvester, who is, I'm not exactly sure of your title, but you work over at Boston Children's Hospital and you are an expert in celiac disease. Yes, that's correct. I'm okay. staff at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm one of the pediatric gastroenterologists there. Okay. And so I have a practice at Boston Children's Hospital, but I actually spend most of my time researching celiac disease. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So before we really get into tonight's topic, can you just tell me and our viewers a little bit about yourself, uh, about yourself, where you grew up, how you came to the Boston area, and why did you s decide to choose this career path? So I think to start with this career path somewhat chose me. Okay. I'm Canadian. I actually grew up on the West Coast. Oh, West uh, Coast. Like Vancouver? Or? About f uh, close to Vancouver, the next oh. closest place. So about five hour drive to the east. Okay. It's a very big country out in that part it of the world. It is a very big country. <laughs> yeah. And so I, first of all, did my undergraduate degree. And then I actually did my PhD in biochemistry and oh. studied protein structure. Wow. Um, okay. Over at the University of Cambridge. And then I decided I wanted to do something that was more related to people, and so I went to medical school. Okay. At the same time, people were, we just, uh, this was a time when we just finished sequencing the human genome, and we're oh very wow. excited about genetics. Okay. And we were just starting to look that there was bacteria in the intestine, and we could find more out about them because we could look at their DNA. Wow. And so I was really excited to learn about that. This was many years before the word microbiome had even been invented. Oh, wow. And okay. And so when I went to medical school, I wanted to get involved in gastroenterology. Oh, and okay. my mentor, Dr. Mohsen Rashid, was actually an expert in celiac disease. Oh. And as a very good mentor, he okay. actually encouraged me to work in his area. Okay. And then when I went to uh, further west to Manitoba for my residency, oh, I continued okay. working in celiac disease. And then I came to Boston for my gastroenterology fellowship, and then I've stayed on as staff at <laughs> and Boston And you just Children's. happen to stay here because we're mm -hmm. such a wonderful area. Yes, and this is probably the best place in the world to study celiac disease. We're very fortunate to have oh. a very strong depth of people here. Cool. Um, working both in academia and in industry, so uh, okay. Boston's very I blessed. thought maybe we were just like more prone to getting celiac disease or anything in the Northeast. But anyway, um, let's back up a little bit. Okay. Or maybe not. What exactly, how would you define celiac disease? Is it really a disease or is it just like a condition or how does... So celiac disease is a genuine disease okay. and we differentiate a disease from a condition because a disease is something that has a pathology and has a mechanism. Okay. I was wondering about that. Whereas okay. a condition would be just a state you're in now and wouldn't okay. necessarily be a disease. Um, oh, okay. For instance, fever is a condition. Okay. Um, celiac disease is an immune condition. And so what happens okay. in celiac disease is that the immune system starts to recognize gluten and okay. starts to attack the cells that line the very first part of the small intestine. Okay. And exactly how that happens, we don't fully understand. Yet. Yet. Okay. We're working on it. You're We're working definitely on working on it. <laughs> um, but we do know that if you take gluten away, then most people will get better. Okay. And so the treatment for celiac disease is a gluten-free diet. Okay. And that's why celiac disease and gluten are somewhat inseparable. They are, but there are some people who are gluten-free but 
do not have celiac. So absolutely, how does that play into, do they have celiac disease, just undiagnosed, or are there other conditions that mimic? So I think I there's probably lots of different people in this sort of non-celiac gluten sensitivity okay. or people who avoid wheat and gluten group who okay. we're really trying to learn more about. Um, probably because lots of people will experiment for themselves, discover that they feel better off gluten. Yeah. And I then not want to people like that. Not <laughs> want to go back to gluten in order to get yeah, a diagnosis okay. of celiac disease. And so okay. probably within these people who are non celiac, there's some people who would have been diagnosed as celiac. Oh, okay. W what are people re reacting to or responding to? Is it the gluten? Is it something else in the grain that's not gluten? Oh, okay. Is it something else that's in products that tend to have these grains in them? Or could it be the processing? Because everything seems to be like hyper processed now, you know, and GMOs are like really in the news lately. I mean, do, do they play a role? So definitely you can select crops to have a higher amount of gluten in them. And so if it's gluten you're reacting okay. to, then you could potentially be more sensitive. Okay. Um, probably it has more to do with things that are intrinsic to the grains oh. that can cause, affect your microbiome, affect your bacteria and okay. what they're doing and how they're processing your food. Okay. Um, in terms of strict definitions, we would say that a non-celiac gluten sensitivity means by definition you don't have celiac disease. Okay. So in order to have a diagnosis, you don't have the antibodies that we typically see in people that have antibodies. Okay. Um, and your biopsy would be Specific normal. antibodies. Yes. So okay. people with celiac... you still have to have some kind of antibodies, I would think. Yes, exactly. Like so uh, people... Sorry to sound like so remedial, but... Hey, no, it's no, good to I start... I did not go to medical school, so... <laughs> it's great to start at the beginning. Okay. So people with celiac disease, when they mount this immune reaction to gluten, they make antibodies to gluten, and then they also make antibodies to another enzyme that can process gluten called tissue transglutaminase. Okay. And so when we screen for celiac disease, we do a blood test looking for these tissue transglutaminase antibodies. Okay. And then if we find those antibodies, typically the next step would be to do a biopsy and see if we can actually see the damage in the first part of the small intestine. Okay. Now, is it just the small intestine that's affected, or are there other organs in the whole GI tract that... So celiac disease is really interesting. It's an autoimmune disease. And okay. so because your body's mounting an attack against this tissue transglutaminase, which is your own body's enzyme. Uh, okay. And tissue transglutaminase is actually, there's different isoforms of it, so different forms that are very similar, and it's in pretty much every tissue type. And uh, so celiac okay. disease has symptoms in almost every body symptom system. So some people have abdominal pain, some people have diarrhea, some people have headaches, some people have joint pain, some people have headaches. rashes. Okay, and that just seems so unrelated. But yeah, okay. some people have mood changes. The really little kids, okay. the one and two year olds when we diagnose them, yeah. usually the first thing that gets better is that they're just nicer people to be around and they don't have as many temper tantrums. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I know a couple of two and three year olds. That <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work for all of them, but if they have celiac disease, then typically okay. the first thing the families will notice is that they just uh, are... Okay happier Cares. and you know <laughs> less, up, less 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 okay. less readily upset um so yeah definitely celiac disease kind of affects in many parts of the body okay now you were talking about testing with the enzymes and everything um when somebody is being tested for celiac we talked about this earlier when you first you know when we first yeah. met that there is a genetic or a DNA component? Do you ever test for that first to see if there more pre there's a predisposition, or do you just go straight to enzymes? I mean, what's the what's the so typically the, the first test would be the antibody tests. Okay. Um, the genetic testing is helpful. The problem is that just because you have the gene doesn't mean that you necessarily have the disease. Okay. The gene tells you that you have the ability to display gluten to your immune system okay. and stimulate an immune response, so but it doesn't mean you necessarily do that. So when would you get the genetic testing done? So in, in what two scenarios? situations, okay. we've realized that people who have really, really high antibody levels, most of them, over 99.9% .9 of them will have an abnormal biopsy. Okay. And so the Europeans have developed some guidelines for children where if they have a really high antibody level, we might check for a second type of antibody and do genetic testing instead of a biopsy. Okay. It also can be helpful if we're trying to see if somebody who you know, maybe is coming as non-celiac gluten sensitivity and is on a gluten-free diet, okay. the antibodies, if you have celiac disease on a gluten-free diet, go to normal. And so we can really only diagnose celiac disease okay. at this point in time if you're eating gluten. 
Okay. But if you're somebody who are wondering about celiac disease versus non-celiac sensitivity, if you don't have the genetics that put you at risk of celiac disease, okay. then we're probably not looking at celiac disease that's treated. We're looking at something else. Okay. I think my brain's about to explode. But <laughs> this is a lot to take in. Yes. It's, so. it's complicated, and the genetic testing because celiac disease isn't like something like sickle cell anemia where okay. if you have the mutation in your hemoglobin molecule, okay. then you have the disease. All right. You have a mutation that puts you at risk for a disease. Okay. But there's something else that has to happen okay. in the environment to make that person who has the ability to display gluten actually display it and react to okay. it. And we don't know what that is. Okay. I'm not sure if this is related to celiac, but I've, and it's not on my cheat sheet, but I've heard from people who have voluntarily taken gluten out of their diet they are also they also have other sensitivities like a lactose intolerant or a nut in sensitivity do if someone is has celiac disease do they also have other food allergies or is it pretty much just the gluten sensitivity and how does that all tie into each other are they related at all so <laughs> we th they are related because definitely okay. people with celiac disease have a higher rate of food allergies and you see that if you have any sort of social event for people with celiac disease because okay. of so many different food allergies typically every dish on the buffet will have the full ingredient list so that people can look okay. for their specific food allergies rather it than must just take saying you like eight hours to go grocery shopping if you have celiac disease, if you have to like read every, because they put wheat in everything. Yes, they do. And gluten is hard to find because gluten isn't on a label and gluten can be in wheat or bi barley or, wi or rye or malt extract is usually barley. Uh, and so that oh, would be gluten. Okay. And so there's actually, we have a class at Children's Hospital for our patients who get diagnosed with celiac disease okay. so that they can learn just the intricacies of how to follow a gluten-free diet because okay. it is complicated and it, grocery shopping can be difficult. The good thing is that fruits and vegetables are all gluten-free. <laughs> and so that's part of the reason why people may feel better on a gluten-free diet is because as you said, a lot of food is very processed these days. Right. You can buy gluten-free processed foods, which are probably just as bad for you as the processed foods that contain gluten. Uh, probably. But they're much more expensive. So most right. people on a gluten-free diet eat less processed food. Uh, okay. And so by default, they just, it's healthier. Yes. You can eat okay. a very unhealthy gluten-free diet, and it's becoming easier as more and more gluten-free substitutes are available. Okay, but it some of those substitutes probably aren't the healthiest option exactly. either. You can get gluten-free donuts. You can get gluten-free chicken fingers. <laughs> yeah, gluten-free donuts. You know, what could possibly go wrong with that? Yeah. Lots of fat, lots of sugar, just like the real thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. I totally lost my next question, but that's okay. I, that's why I have the cheat sheet. Um, why has celiac disease become more prominent? Is it the tests are becoming more accurate or do you think it's just, you know, the environment that we're in, more people are prone to having these issues? I think it's probably a combination of both. So these antibody tests that we use now really only became widely available in the 1990s. Uh, and when okay. we started using these tests, really the picture of what celiac disease is changed because Initially, celiac disease was thought of a condition that happened to babies when they were being weaned and having solid foods introduced, which is when they oh, first get gluten. Okay. And some kids develop celiac disease at that age, and they'll lose a lot of weight and have a lot of diarrhea oh, and okay. really look very sick. And so this is really the picture of celiac disease. Okay. But what we're realizing is that actually you can develop celiac disease at any time. I was and so you can develop celiac disease in your 20s, in your 30s, even in your 80s or 90s. Wow. And so if you have these genes, you're always at risk of celiac disease. Um, we just don't know what it is plus these genes that you need. Definitely uh, probably okay. gluten, because if you don't see gluten, you're not going to react to it. Okay. But what's the additional thing? We're not yeah. really sure. Uh, okay. And there are studies going on at this time to try figuring that out? Yes. Actually, we know much more than we did even three or four years ago. Okay. Because in the 1990s, the Swedish had a celiac epidemic. And so really? suddenly, okay. the rate of celiac disease, particularly in young children, absolutely skyrocketed. Okay. And at the same time, they had changed the recommendations for breastfeeding and the recommendations for what food to introduce first. Okay. And so there was all sorts of theories that how much gluten you gave or when you gave it or how okay. much you breastfed or when you stopped breastfeeding made a difference. 
But these are all epidemiology studies, which are observational studies, where you look at what's oh, happening and you say, oh, okay. these two things are connected. But yeah. it doesn't necessarily doesn't mean, mean that one causes the other. Oh, uh, okay. And so the next it's thing they did could is... Could be just a coincidence. So. Exactly. Oh, okay. So the next thing they did is because we have this genetic testing, mm -hmm. we can actually look at blood of babies and identify those who are at risk for developing celiac disease. Okay. So there were several s studies where they found these kids who are at genetic risk of celiac disease. Some of them, they followed them. Others, they randomized them, so they would have a certain amount of gluten, or they would get gluten at a certain age. Okay. And they tried to see if there was any difference, okay. and there wasn't. Oh, okay. Um, similarly, there's not a difference if you have a cesarean birth or a vaginal birth. It doesn't okay. affect the risk of celiac disease. And so we okay. had all these great theories, but when we tested them, it didn't really seem to pan out. Now, okay. maybe there's a bit of a signal that how much gluten you get matters. But oh, okay. So if you're if you're getting like in the top quarter of gluten versus people who are getting okay. in the bottom quarter of gluten, you're more likely to have celiac disease. Okay. Well, along with the babies and the study and the yeah. food being introduced, what about women who you know nursing women? If they eat the gluten, does that transfer to the baby? Have yes. Is there a so connection there? Yes. So when uh, women are lactating the proteins that they eat are present in breast milk. Okay. So after eating gluten or eggs or milk or other proteins, you can detect that in, in breast milk. So okay. if your mother is consuming gluten, then you're seeing it. And okay. there's all sorts of theories. If you see it in breast milk, then does that affect how your body responds? Oh, okay. And it's not really clear. Mm, okay. The current theories are that it has something to do with viruses uh, because okay viruses affect how your intestinal immune system responds because okay. your intestine is essentially programmed to tolerate things. Okay. So we don't react to all the food we eat and we don't react to okay. all of the bacteria that are there. Okay. Um, but when you have a virus, then you have to fight something. And oh. so then sometimes maybe okay. you're recognizing something you shouldn't be recognizing. Okay. I thought of the other question earlier. We were talking about grocery shopping. Yes. Is it possible for someone with celiac to go out to a restaurant? And how do you analyze the menu because you don't really know how food is prepared? Exactly, and I think this is probably the most intimidating and the most anxiety provoking experience for my patients with celiac disease okay. because it's easier to follow a gluten-free diet when you're home and you feel like you have control. When you're at a restaurant or somebody else's mm -hmm. house, you're giving that control to somebody else. Yeah. And a gluten-free diet is complicated because things don't really necessarily come and say they have gluten on them. And there's okay. things that you wouldn't necessarily think about. So if you've ever worked in a restaurant and look at the fryer, it has all these little grimleys on it yeah. that are actually... Well, fried food in general is probably not you know, the healthiest yeah. for you. But, but if, you, yes. if you fry gluten-free things, because potatoes are gluten-free, so mm -hmm. if you have potatoes, that sometimes the french fries are coated in flour, so you have to ask about that. But if they're gluten-free french fries and you put them in a fryer where you're also doing the, doing the bread and things, then you yeah. can get cross-contamination. And so uh, okay. it's not just what's in the food, it's how you prepare the food. Okay. And so gluten can sneak in at all sorts of different oh, times along lovely. the way. Yeah. So you don't know whether to trust that gluten-free page on the menu exactly. all the time. The gluten-free page is a great start, but really you have to ask the people who are providing the food okay. what they're doing. And restaurants are getting very savvy about this, and uh, often okay. they'll ask, is this a dietary preference or is this an allergy? Because oh, okay. if it's a preference, then they're less careful about cross-contamination. But if it's an allergy, then they'll okay. clean the grill and make sure okay. they use separate... Now, would celiac coffees. be considered an allergy? So celiac disease is actually, by definition, not an allergy. Okay. But it's the same idea as an allergy in that so you don't want to be exposed to, to small amounts. Okay. So and you're so just the type of precautions you take for somebody who has a wheat allergy oh, are the same okay. type of precautions you take for somebody who has celiac disease. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Other than gluten-free, you know, eating a gluten-free diet, are there other treatments that individuals with celiac need to take into consideration? Like, do they have to take certain medicines as well, or is it just... So the only treatment we have for celiac disease right now is a gluten-free diet. Is a gluten-free diet. And okay. that's really been the treatment for decades Ever. and decades, since okay. World War II, essentially. Ah. And so we're now at a period of time where we're starting to get some more treatments because we're learning a little bit more about how it works. Okay. So um, gluten, part of the reason it's a problem is that the protein itself isn't digested very well. 
because okay. proteins are like strings of amino acids. So it's like okay. a bunch of Legos. Okay. And then the enzymes in your stomach take these big proteins and they basically separate down. out the Legos based on you know what two colors are beside Good each analogy. other. Good analogy. Good analogy. And you. so gluten, because of the colors that are in the Lego, people can't break it up very well. So the protein survives. Okay. But bacteria actually can make some enzymes that can cut gluten very well. Okay. And that's part of what happens when you make sourdough bread. Oh. So sourdough bread has gluten in it, but it has less gluten because the bacteria have eaten some of the okay. some of the gluten when you do your culture. Now, are there levels of celiac where somebody could still eat sourdough because it's a lower? Sadly, no. So okay. the amount of gluten sourdough it's an all or nothing is, thing. is still pretty high. Okay. There's definitely people who've been trying to work on engineering a sourdough bread that okay. might be low enough gluten, but that really hasn't been very successful. Okay. Because people with celiac disease are quite sensitive to small amounts of gluten. Okay. And so when you see gluten free on a package, that actually means there's less than 20 parts per million of gluten. Okay. And that is acceptable to most? And so that's the threshold that's defined because okay. you can't say zero because you can't measure zero. True. But you can measure below a certain threshold. Uh, okay. And so most people seem to be okay eating some products that are 20 parts okay. per million, but that's really not defined on science. Okay. Other than what is the limit of the test we could have when we set the limit. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm not sure if we, if you had already answered this, but we talked about children versus adults. Is it the s same testing that's done? Is it how 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 would you treat a child differently than an adult? Or would you treat them differently in figuring out if they had celiac? So the first step is the same. Okay. You can't diagnose celiac disease if you don't think about diagnosing celiac disease. If okay. you never look for it, you'll never find it. And so okay. first step is to think about celiac disease, which could be your kid with headaches, could be your kid with joint pain. Okay could be somebody who doesn't seem to have any symptoms, but their sibling was just diagnosed with celiac disease. Oh, um, okay. And so the first step in screening is to do the blood test, looking for these antibodies okay. to this tissue transmutaminase. So this is like everybody thing. goes through this And so that's usually the first step. Level one. And okay. then if that's positive, then the next step would be referral to a gastroenterologist. Mm -hmm. uh, for kids, as I mentioned earlier, if kids have a really high antibody level, then okay. sometimes we'll use antibodies and genetics to make the diagnosis. Okay. But the sort of gold standard for making diagnosis is to do a biopsy. So okay. what a biopsy means is that we have an endoscope, which is basically a long tube okay. that has a camera and a light on the end so we can see where we're going. Okay. And then inside is a little tube so we can stick in our really, really long we handled, very tiny piece of tweezers, exactly, okay. to get a sample. And so of like your intestines. Exactly. How pleasant. Yes, but it's very tiny. It's a very very small <laughs> pinch. And so we can go down the throat and oh, the esophagus, okay. stomach, and oh, first part of oh. small intestine. For kids, we Knock sedate them. them um, <laughs> like adults. I don't think I'd want to be awake for that. <laughs> yes, most people don't want to be awake, but sometimes in adult practice, we sedate them. Okay. Not at all or much less than we do for children. Okay. Yeah. And then we get very small pieces of the small intestine. And then we look under the microscope, and then we can see that the villi, which are the part that does the yeah. absorbing, okay. have kind of gone flat. Oh. And that's okay. the picture that helps us really diagnose celiac disease. Okay. So with that, the villi, villi going flat, yeah. do they ever puff up again when you take away uh, gluten? Yes. Or do they stay flat? Because once the, once the damage is done, it's, it's done. No, the intestine is actually amazing because it regenerates. And so oh, okay. the whole covering of your small intestine, all of those cells, they start. So you have the villi, and then yep. beside the villi are the crypts, which are kind of like the ditches. Okay. And so there's stem cells in the bottom of those ditches. Oh, and they're always okay. dividing, and they replace the whole lining of your intestine about every week. Wow. And okay. so when you take gluten away, and these cells can grow, and they're not being attacked, then the villi oh. grow back. So if somebody did have a gluten sensitivity, once they removed gluten from their diet, it would only take like a couple of weeks to, you know, so feel it's, so better? So it's, it's, it's variable. Um, so if somebody had celiac disease, celiac disease they would have celiac. bellus atrophy. Somebody who has gluten sensitivity, their villi look normal. Oh. Even when they're eating gluten. Wow. Okay. No, I'm really confused. Yeah, so, so celi okay. celiac disease is your immune condition oh, where your okay. body's attacking your villi okay. and your villi gets short. 
okay. and then you have wheat allergy, which is when you have the same type of reaction as if you have uh, okay. a peanut allergy, which is more of an IgE-mediated reaction. Okay. And then you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is not celiac disease and not allergy. Okay. And so these people don't have the antibodies and they have a normal looking intestine, but they okay. have symptoms when they have gluten. Okay. Sorry to make you repeat yourself, but I'm just trying to process all of this. So, like, if somebody with celiac does have, s intakes gluten, yes. they eat a loaf of bread or a cheeseburger at McDonald's or whatever, yes. um, is it life-threatening or like, an, like a peanut allergy? Do so they need, like, an EpiPen or do they just feel horrible for the next week? Symptoms are highly variable. Okay. And the more we're learning, the more we're learning that sometimes people with celiac disease may get small amounts of gluten and not have any symptoms at all. Okay. And even at diagnosis, we can find people who have absolutely flat villi okay. and very high antibody levels who don't have any symptoms. Oh. And so we really don't understand the relationship between what the intestine looks like and the symptoms. Okay. But certainly exposure to gluten may cause no symptoms. It may cause abdominal pain, may cause vomiting, headaches, joint pain. Usually an individual has specific symptoms that are reproducible. Okay. And on the extreme end is something called celiac crisis, which is when you have electrolyte disturbances and okay. that's a situation where you'd be hospitalized. But that that's not very common, scary. that's very rare. Yeah. Okay, so with the person who's not showing any symptoms, how would they know to get tested? So typically we find those people because somebody else in their family gets diagnosed. Okay. Because celiac disease is a, has this genetic predisposition. Uh, if somebody gets okay. diagnosed, then we recommend that their first degree relatives, so their parents, their brothers and sisters, and their children get screened. Uh, okay. And so a lot of people are picked up that way. Okay. Or they might not have symptoms, but they have anemia because okay. those villi also absorb iron. And so if you can't absorb iron very well, then you get anemia. And right. so anemia is another reason to s look for celiac disease. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, headaches, you know, anemia, yeah. um, cramping, what were yeah. some of the other things that you had mentioned? Joint pain, joint pains, rashes, mouth sores. Okay, with all of that, how would you know to test for celiac, is it like the first test that you do? Or, you know, somebody's got headaches, do you send them to a neurologist first? or how do, how do you narrow it down to figure out that celiac might be an option? Are there multiple symptoms that they have, or is it? Sometimes they have multiple symptoms. Okay. And sometimes there's a family history. Okay. And so we know that looking at people who have um, a family history of celiac disease, if it's documented in their chart that there's a family history, they're more okay. likely to be tested. Okay. Um, because again, you have to think about celiac disease before you look. Right, okay. And that means having a high index of suspicion. And certainly, okay. I am always amazed, there's lots of fantastic pediatricians and I get a kid in clinic who has only headaches or only joint pain and has a high TPG and has celiac disease. And that's hmm. certainly not the first thing somebody would think about, but okay. their smart physician has thought about it and done the testing and they've ah, come to our clinic. Well, how convenient. Yeah, so again, it's a matter of, okay. you have to think, could this be celiac disease? And do the screening test. Okay. Now, oftentimes, as my under I, 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 as I understand it, yeah, I know how to talk. Someone would could potentially just have celiac disease, or are there options, or are there common situations where somebody who has celiac disease also has lactose intolerant, or also has, you know, some other kind of peanut allergies, or. Yes, absolutely. Do they, so or heart condition or something, do, do they? Yeah, so there's sort of two ways you can get things with celiac disease. One okay. is as a consequence of the celiac disease. So with celiac disease, you get what we call a secondary lactose intolerance. Okay. Because those villi, the tips of the villi, yeah. not only are absorbing iron, but they're also absorbing lactose. Okay. So if you don't have very much lactase, you can't absorb the lactose and then you'll have lactose intolerance. Okay. When we take the gluten away and you grow your villi back, then you can have lactose again. Ah, okay. Um, and if you're not absorbing um, iron very well, you get anemia. If you're not absorbing calcium very well, you can get bone fractures and you can get osteoporosis. Okay. And so because of the consequences of malabsorption, you can have 
symptoms there. Okay. The other thing that happens is that the genetic predisposition for celiac disease is shared with other conditions. Such so as? Type 1 diabetes and thyroid disease are the oh, most common. Okay. So of the people who have type 1 diabetes, probably somewhere around 5 to 8% have celiac disease. Okay. That doesn't seem too huge. Well, that's 1 in 20. Oh, yeah. Okay, now that you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like, so no, 80 percent. Um, a lot of diabetes clinics actually screen their type oh, 1 diabetics looking okay. for celiac disease. Okay. Yeah. And then well. th hypothyroidism, so autoimmune thyroid disease, is very common. Oh, okay. And very common in patients with celiac disease as well. So in situations like the type 1 diabetes or the hypothyroid? Yes. Could they ever be diagnosed without the celiac component, even though the celiac component kind of exists? So uh, we've tried to look at which one comes first. Is it the celiac yeah. disease or type 1 diabetes? Okay. And certainly they can come in any order. Okay. There's some debate whether if you diagnose celiac disease, you decrease the rate of developing other conditions. Okay. Um, and definitely we see a trend in our clinics that we have okay. much more, m many more patients coming from diabetes clinic to celiac clinic than from celiac clinic to okay. diabetes clinic. Oh. And so the thought is Got that it. maybe by treating the celiac disease, you're improving how tight your intestine is. Oh. Okay. And you're also turning off that constant inflammation. Oh, and so maybe that okay. is protective. Okay. I think I'm following you. Yeah. Okay. No. I'm reading this question and then trying to process what you just told me. So let's use the scenario of type 1 diabetes. Wait, I'm thinking type 2 diabetes. But Right, so that's the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. That's a really important point. Okay. So type 1 diabetes is the sort of classical autoimmune diabetes that often presents in childhood where you attack the islet cells in your pancreas. Okay. And these are the cells that make insulin. Right. And so then you can't make insulin, and then very early on in type 1 diabetes, you get insulin injections, okay. and really it's insulin injections for life. Okay. Because we don't, just like celiac disease, we only have a gluten-free diet, type 1 diabetes, we really only have insulin. Okay. Um, although they are starting to get some better treatments for type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is the one that's becoming more common, mm -hmm. which is associated with insulin resistance in people who are overweight. Okay. And so the autoimmune one, the type 1 diabetes, is the one that's more common. That never goes celiac away. Celiac disease. Yeah. And that never goes away, and the celiac disease pretty much never goes away. Exactly. Okay. So if someone is diagnosed with more than one condition, pretty much uh, the hypothyroidism, right. it's so never going away. Exactly. Okay. Because I'm thinking, you know, sometimes people with type 2 diabetes, if they get something else under control, then they can come off their medications. Exactly. But not with yeah. the celiac-related... Yeah. And these immune conditions, when your immune system learns to recognize gluten or learns to recognize your okay. pancreas or learns to recognize your thyroid, then okay. we're working on ways to try and get the immune system to unlearn. But for okay. now, once it's learned, it'll keep making that reaction. How, do you, how does your immune system unlearn something? So um, one way is, um, the sort of more extreme way is if you do a uh, stem cell transplant. So often if people have a leukemia or a lymphoma, oh, okay. part of the treatment might be to do a stem cell transplant, which essentially means taking bone marrow type cells okay. from somebody else and putting them into that person after you've gotten rid of all of theirs. And because How that do you bone get rid marrow, of all your well, prim primarily with um, radiation, there's different oh, okay. protocols. All so right, right. the idea is that if you have a cancer that's okay. uh, that's in your cells that make your blood, okay. then you want to get rid of the cells that make your blood, okay. and then replace them with. So some like that you are don't want to get rid of your blood because that would just exactly and horribly. Yes, and so they've worked out a, a, a protocol where they can do this. Oh, okay. And so essentially, what you do when you have a stem cell transplant is you get a new immune system. Oh, okay. And so that new immune system doesn't recognize gluten. But okay. it's a complicated thing, and there's lots of other risks, so that's really not a treatment for celiac disease. But that's okay. one way to reprogram okay. the immune system. Um, there's another group that's working on vaccines and oh, trying to see if okay. they can use vaccines to reprogram the immune system. Um, and we're actually doing some studies at the Beth Israel looking at whether we can inject some nanoparticles and wow. reprogram okay. the immune system. Yeah.
which wow. is very, very exciting. And again, I think we're at an exciting time because we're starting to talk about treatments for celiac disease other than gluten-free diet. Other than gluten-free diet. Yeah. Wow. Now, total tangent, where is all of the funding coming from for all of these, you know, nanotechnology studies or vaccine studies? I mean, are there grants available? Is it government funding? Is it, you know... That's a very good question, actually, because... Do you have to, you know, hold a bake sale? Well, bake <laughs> sale is probably not the best option, but, you know, do you have to do your own fundraising, you know? Yes. Yeah, so okay. celiac disease, we've actually looked at this, the funding rates for celiac disease compared to other gastrointestinal disorders. And in the United States, the big source of funding for scientific research and medical research is the National Institutes of Health. And okay. so when we look at what they fund, relative to the number of people who have celiac disease, celiac disease is grossly underfunded. Oh, and so okay. there's not a lot of federal research money that's being spent on celiac disease. Okay. And then if you look at the other place where research money comes from, which is patients and friends and family of patients, okay. there is not as organized of a celiac community. And so there's not as okay. many opportunities for funding for celiac disease as there is for, say, inflammatory bowel disease or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's uh, disease. Okay. And so definitely one of the things that helps the field back is lack of funding. Okay. Now, as you're talking about this, I'm also thinking if someone is diagnosed, if somebody, or if, yeah, if somebody's diagnosed with having celiac disease, are there support groups or resources presented to them so they know how to go on a gluten-free diet, so they do gain the confidence to go out to dinner? I mean, is there a support group just to talk about some of the yes. stresses of everyday life? I mean, where would somebody go for that? So there's a few places you can go. Okay. At Boston Children's, we have our Celiac Kids Connection, which okay. is a patient and family support group. And so one of the things we have that's very effective is a Facebook page. Oh, cool. And so I gotta uh, like that. Yes. And the people who follow the gluten-free diet and know the gluten-free diet are often the best resource. Okay. And so often somebody will post, here's a list of Halloween candy that's gluten-free, which is a really important ah, thing to know. Okay. Just like some families need to know the nut-free Halloween candy or the milk-free. So okay. um, you can get a list of gluten-free Halloween candy. We also have events, um, oh, which okay. are opportunities for kids to meet other kids with celiac disease because yeah not everybody knows somebody else and also to eat anything on the table because of course at a celiac event but all also the food is you know free. kids sometimes pick up that oh i'm different and if you're always sitting at the allergy table you probably feel sometimes like a mutant but if you're going to people or going to an event with other people and realizing hey this is normal yes that's got to be a big confidence boost yeah absolutely and that's why the guidelines for looking after people with for celiac disease okay. are to refer them to a support group. Okay. And so the um, adults we have, we're very lucky, the National Celiac Association is actually based in Massachusetts. Oh, how convenient. And so we have some local chapters of the okay. um, National Celiac Association. And so that's a way for adults to get involved. Okay. Now, it's based in Massachusetts, but is it really national or? Yes. So okay. there's there's different um, CELAC organizations in different regions okay. and they're starting to merge because there's power in having a united voice. Okay. And so the National CELAC Association has chapters in the Northeast as well as in the South and Southeast. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. And information is available through like your office? National CELAC National Association, CELAC. Okay. Google. Okay. Yeah. Or CELACKidsConnection.org is our ah, CELAC Kids okay. Connection. So I think we already talked about something like this. Uh, you know, my next question is like, could somebody ever be cured? But not, not really, can they? Not yet. So okay. I think definitely it's very exciting that now there's some treatments in the pipeline. Okay. Whereas even five or 10 years ago, there wasn't as many things that were at a stage where we were actually starting to test them in people. Okay. And most treatments fail in test tubes or animals before they ever get to people. Oh, okay. So just getting something to the t stage where you're ready to try it in people is a huge step. Okay. And so right now there's a few different treatments that they're starting to do tests in people. Okay. And so what types of treatments are they? Um, there's some that are enzymes because if you could give people an enzyme that uh, could okay. cut up the gluten, then maybe they wouldn't have a problem. Oh, so like process some 
an enzyme introduced to break down the gluten? Yeah, kind of like if you have lactose intolerance, you okay. can take a lactase enzyme. Uh, okay. And so the idea is that you could take a glutenase enzyme. Oh, okay. And so right now there's some you can buy, but those don't work well enough. Okay. And so there's been some work to try and engineer enzymes to make them work better. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Sounds pretty complicated. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's complicated, but it's amazing what we can do with science. Okay, now, so with some of these trials, yeah. how long do you think it'll be before we actually see it? You said we are starting to see them now? Yeah, so we're starting to run some trials and we're recruiting for trials, okay. um, both Bezzy's What Bezzy's are the risks of general. being involved in a trial? I mean, how, how, what is the process for being involved in a trial? So the first part of the process is to find out about the trial. So you can either contact us, look at our website, okay. or clinicaltrials.gov lists okay. all the clinical trials so you can put but in But if you're condition. looking for someone to... To participate. To participate. What are we looking for? Yeah. Yeah. So typically we start with adults. Okay. Um, and um, sometimes the first thing is to try the treatment in somebody who doesn't have celiac disease because the first step of testing a drug is just to see is it safe in people or is okay. it causing some effect that we don't want to give it to lots of people. Okay. And so the first step with any drug is to show that it's safe in humans. And then once you've shown uh, that okay. it's safe in humans, the next step is to see does it actually do what you want to do uh, okay. for the disease you're trying so to treat. So then you would introduce and it so to a celiac patient. And then you would introduce patient. it to patients with celiac disease. Uh, okay. And so in order to see if it works for somebody with celiac disease, we need to find people who have celiac disease. And okay. It's interesting because people are very excited about new therapies, mm -hmm. but in order to test new therapies, we actually have to get people to eat gluten for us because we can't see And they see know they feel funny, so they don't want to do it. Oh, exactly. Okay. So you've got this little catch-22 thing going very on. Very much so, yeah. Okay. But there's always amazing people who do amazing things for research who okay. have been really moving the science along. Okay. Um, and so most studies involve either taking a treatment and then a gluten challenge or okay, what's a gluten challenge? So a gluten challenge is when you take somebody who has celiac disease who's on a gluten-free diet and okay. you give them gluten on purpose. Okay, now you, do you start introducing it slowly or bam, all of a sudden here, eat this loaf of bread? Or you know. It depends on the study. Okay. And so one of the studies we're doing right now, we're actually trying to figure out if there's a better way to do a gluten challenge. Can you do okay. a gluten challenge that you need less gluten and still okay. see if somebody's responding or not? Or certain type, you know, yeah. gluten in, uh, there are different types of gluten because we mentioned like the rye and the wheat and other grains and... Yeah, that's a really important point. So we often talk about gluten as if it's one thing. Yeah. Kind of like sucrose is one thing. Right. But actually gluten is a protein and it's made in certain plants because plants have to store protein. Um, okay. Just like we have to store protein and we store carbohydrates, plants have to do the same thing. And so okay. what they do is they make gluten and then gluten is inside their cells and then if there's a drought or they don't have fertilizer and they need to okay. build enzymes and survive. basically survive, then they break down this gluten and use those okay. amino acid Legos to build whatever they need. Okay. And so different plants make different glutens. Okay. So they're very similar, but they're not necessarily identical. Now is gluten, s gluten is not syn synonymous with protein because there are proteins that Absolutely. have nothing to do. Okay. Yes. So um, proteins are very common. So okay. milk is a protein, egg is a protein, peanut has protein in it. Um, and the s cells, the enzymes, the things that do reactions, most of those okay. are made from protein. Okay. So wait, I think I interrupted you. That's okay. Okay, where were we? I think we were talking about different treatments. Different types of, di di different types of gluten. Yes, different types of gluten. Okay. And so um, there's even different forms. So in wheat, it's gliadin. And in um, rye, it's hoarding and in oats. It's, sorry, rye, it's and in oats. And then barley, it's hoarding. And so okay. these are very similar proteins. Okay. But then plants themselves, they actually have, they're mixed together in the way they're bred, they have multiple copies of their genome. So okay. as humans, we have two copies. Plants okay. might have six or eight. Okay. And so each of those copies of the genome can make a slightly different gluten. Oh. And so gluten is complicated because it's not just one thing. 
And this is okay. one of the reasons why it's been challenging to come up with alternatives to gluten-free diet okay. or come up with a way to somehow detoxify gluten because okay. it's not as simple as lactose where you just have to break these two sugars apart. Okay. Now you had mentioned wheat and rye and barley was the other one that you mentioned? Yes. What about other grains like oats or rice, rice. or corn? Or so I mean, uh, are those safe? Yes. So the, there's some grains that make proteins that have gluten, and then there's other grains that don't. And then okay. you can have cross-contamination of gluten-free grains okay. with gluten at any point along the way. Okay. And so the grain that we talk about the most is actually oats because there's... Okay. Two things about oats. One is that they have a protein called avidin, okay. which looks sort of like gluten, but is slightly different. Okay. And it's been controversial whether or not people with celiac disease recognize avidin in the same way that they recognize as gliadin. Oh, um, okay. But they've done some studies feeding people gluten-free oats and showing that actually it seems like most people seem to be able to tolerate gluten-free uh, oats that aren't oats. contaminated. Okay. Um, the How do you tell if something's contaminated? You can't? Well, you can't, and you actually, it's interesting, because I think we don't really appreciate where our food comes from. Okay. And actually, when you buy... It's not that we don't appreciate, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you buy oat seeds and you plant them, yeah. you can buy pure oat seed, and that actually can have a certain amount of non-oat grains in it. Oh. And so when you're planting your field with oats, that might actually have a little bit of wheat and a little bit of barley in it. Oh, wow. And the field itself, if you've ever had a garden, you know that in the spring, you have all sorts of plants volunteering from last year because mm -hmm. life regenerates itself on its own. Yes. Um, I did not realize that tomatoes would show, yes. uh, you know, yes. are perennials and they are in my garden. Yes. So. Yes, because all of these plants have seeds yes. and then they they grow the next season. Okay. And so in order to make gluten-free oats, there's two ways of doing it. One okay. is to start with pure oats in clean fields and make sure that you keep everything gluten-free the whole way through, mm. which that there's like many, many steps and it's complicated. And there's not very, it, there's not very many of those oats made just because it's fairly labor intensive. Yeah. The okay. other thing is to take these regular oats called commodity oats okay. that have Whatever, whatever amount of gluten they have in them okay. and try and separate the gluten from them. How do you do that? And so th there's different... Oat, barley. Oat, y y y that seems pretty labor intensive too. But well, it's <laughs> actually, it's <laughs> interesting because... <laughs> Gotta be something um, easier than that. Companies have actually developed ways to automate this process. Okay. And so it's called mechanical optical sorting. Optical because sorting. the okay. size and the color of oats okay. is slightly different than the size and the color of rye hmm. and wheat and barley. Okay. And so they've developed processes where based on those characteristics, they can separate them out. Oh, okay. And so that's how they make the oats for something like Cheerios, where oh, they need okay. many, many, many more times oats than there are made purity protocol oats in a oh, year okay. just to make Cheerios. So could someone with celiac have Cheerios? So it's controversial. There okay. were some. <laughs> there were some. What's a safe food? What's a safe food? Rice is safe. Corn is safe. Every fruit and vegetable. Yeah, but you know, the is born gluten you know, free. A banana just doesn't always last for very long. No, um, nuts are gluten free. So bananas, peanut butter. Um, yogurt, dairy products tend okay. to be gluten-free. Where you run into trouble is when they start to get processed or when you start to add flavorings or sauce because oh, okay. gluten thickens things. And well, of course. these grains are cheap. And okay. also malt and malt flavoring is also okay. often made from barley. And so okay. that gives flavor. Okay. And so lots of products have malt flavoring. Okay. So Rice Krispies, for instance, they're made out of rice. You'd think they'd be gluten-free. But they flavor you them with think. malt flavoring that's made from barley. Of so course. they're not gluten free. So, again, it's complicated. Because I'm just thinking, you know, s some of my friends are like, oh, I have to get a gluten free recipe for something. And I'm thinking, well, if you're making a cake, can't you just, and you've, you've explained this a little bit, why can't you just go get a Quaker oat thing and pulverize the oats and use that as flour? Like because if you had your gluten free pure oats? Apparently not. So you can buy oats that are 
gluten free. I was thinking, you know, the big drum with the little Quaker guy on the yeah. front, you know. So those are the oats that are these commodity oats. Commodity and so oats. they've been grown starting with not 100% oat seed and mm -hmm. even just if you take rail cars that had wheat in them and then you transport oats in them, okay. it's really hard to really clean all of a rail car. Yeah. And so there's contamination well, I'm going just back by to transport. The 20 parts per million. I'm like, okay, yeah. big storage yeah. train car. I'm just like, okay. So you think that's 20 particles of wheat in a million particles of oats? It, uh, okay. Seems plausible. Yeah. So, and, okay. and, and, and they're working on it. And one of the things that, um, there are rules about gluten-free because the okay. FDA, gluten-free is a health claim. And so putting gluten-free on a product is actually regulated. And so in order to call something okay. gluten-free, it has to test less than 20 parts per million. Right. Or be less than 20 parts per okay. million. What about like some of the, the new trendy grains? Like, is it quinoa or quinoa. something? So quinoa is gluten-free. Okay. Um, teff is gluten-free. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, so teff is used a lot in North Africa. Okay. Um, and um, spelt is an ancient form of wheat, so that is not gluten-free. Okay. Um, kamut is a form of wheat as well. Amaranth is gluten-free. Okay. Um, and then your legumes, so chickpea flour or lentil flour, those Didn't would be gluten-free. Didn't realize they had flowers. Soy flour is gluten-free. Oh, okay. Potato flour is gluten-free. Hmm. So. All these foods that I didn't know existed. Yes. How cool is that? And just to keep it complicated, even buckwheat is gluten-free. Because wheat. buckwheat is not actually wheat. related to wheat and rye and barley. Well, that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Not. So I'm looking, you know, we only have about five minutes left, okay. believe it or not. So we talked about treatments you said some of the treatments are coming up do you see celiac continuing to grow and become more popular well not popular isn't the right word but more prevalent in the next five years because i think we talked earlier about the the trend whether you know the gmos being introduced and yes. you know in added processing to yeah. food is it related is it not related it's really hard to tell but i thought you had mentioned something about how several health conditions are all moving yes. at the same trend. Yes, so we know that the rate of type 1 diabetes is increasing, the rate of celiac disease okay. is increasing, the rate of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is increasing, the rate of multiple sclerosis is increasing, okay. and these are all autoimmune diseases. And okay. what's really interesting is that although some are more common than others, they're all increasing at the same rate. Okay. And this is a true increase. Okay. Um, it's not purely that we're finding more people, and there's been some really neat studies where they've looked at serum samples that have been banked. So okay. when you get recruited into the military, one of the things okay. they do is take your blood. And some places have stored this blood for decades. Wow, okay. And so they've gone back and tested this blood looking for these antibodies. Okay. And they found that the rate of antibodies in that blood is much lower than if you take military recruits from today. From today, wow. Yeah. Now, another thing that just popped into my head, I remember, um, when I had my kids, and they're now seven and nine, but way back when, it was um, umbilical cord banking, cord banking for the yes. stem cells. Yes. Would that, if you knew that you had celiac or what your first child yeah. had celiac, would banking the cord for future benefit probably know? not and that's part of the reason why when we're talking about cord cell banking we recommend that you give them to a public bank okay. because most people will never need their stem cells okay and w stem cells aren't a treatment that's really being investigated for celiac disease because uh, okay. the thing about celiac disease is that although it's very difficult to follow a gluten-free diet and it's complicated and okay. it can socially be difficult compared to a stem cell transplant it's relatively safe okay got it yeah so I'm just, you know, trying to figure out what are the trends and... Yeah, so the trends are that the prevalence, so the number of people who have celiac disease is increasing. Okay. We're not really sure why. Okay. Um, and so there's an increasing population of people who know they have celiac disease who okay. are on a gluten-free diet. But we think that looking at studies of blood donors and 
looking at population health surveys, we think that actually most people who have celiac disease actually don't know. Oh, because okay. we can look for these antibodies in people, and if we've surveyed them, we know they're not on a gluten-free diet, oh, okay. and so presumably they don't know that they have the antibodies and they okay. can have celiac disease. Now I'm just thinking, somebody might not know they have celiac. Um, I completely lost that question. Well, let's talk about knowing if you have celiac. Yes. I think, um, one of the things you, you mentioned at the very beginning is, is there some reason why we're all studying celiac disease in Boston? Is it more common in Boston? Yeah. And for a long time, it was thought that the Irish were more likely to have celiac disease. Oh, okay. But now we've actually done good studies in most parts of the world looking for celiac disease. Okay. And we know that the global prevalence is actually pretty consistent. So you can find celiac disease in Ireland, you can find it in the United States, you can find it in South America, you can find it in Africa, you can find oh, it in okay. India, Saudi Arabia, China, Korea. Okay, so there's not really like a cultural... Right, because these genes that put you at risk for celiac okay. disease are everywhere. Okay. Why are we seeing more of it? Probably because places that traditionally had more gluten-free grain-based diets, so okay. corn-based or rice-based diets, oh, they're all okay. switching to a more American diet, which oh, has more okay. wheat in it, so they're getting more wheat exposure. Oh, okay. And so that gives them the opportunity to develop a reaction. Okay. Now, if somebody were, um, they didn't show any of the signs or symptoms of celiac, but like you had said, might have it, what would make someone, or whether or not they had it, what would make someone go to a gluten-free diet just for suspecting so I think people go to gluten-free diet for different reasons. Okay. I think there's a perception that a gluten-free diet can be healthier. Okay. I think there's a perception that... <laughs> perception. <laughs> that I love that word. It, it's like everything else. You can have a really unhealthy diet of any type. Okay. Um, or um, it might help them lose weight. Um, or they may feel better because okay. um, there's lots of things that you get rid of when you get rid of wheat and you get rid of gluten. Okay. And fiber is one of the things that's in whole grains that's missing from a lot of gluten-free products. And so maybe okay. some people are just reacting to fiber. And so taking okay. fiber out of their diet is changing how they feel. Oh. We also know that when you change and shift what's in your diet, uh -huh. you're changing these intestinal bacteria because uh -huh. at some level when well you eat food, every you're farming. Week. Exactly, because yeah. okay. whatever you feed is going to encourage the bacteria that like to eat that to grow. Okay. Yeah. Now we only have about a minute left. Okay. Any parting remarks? I think the most important thing is if you're concerned about celiac disease or if you're concerned about gluten, mm -hmm. before you go on a gluten-free diet, make sure that you see your doctor. Okay. Because definitely the best opportunity to screen you for celiac disease is when you're still eating gluten. Okay. And you can ask your doctor for blood testing. And if that's positive, then really before you go on a gluten-free diet, you should determine whether or not you have celiac disease. Because once you've gone on a gluten-free diet, if you have celiac disease, and now your antibodies are gone and your villi look normal, it's much harder to go back and figure uh, it out. Okay. All right. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, thank you for tolerating me because I'm like, wow, I am like really remedial when it comes to this. But I think it's really important that the community is aware that such, you know, such a disease exists. And a Absolutely. condition exists. I just hate calling it a disease, so that's my own hang-up. But anyway, thank you very much. And I also want to thank everyone at home for tuning in this evening. Hopefully you learned as much as I did, if not more. Or, I don't know, hopefully you learned a lot during the course of our conversation this evening. Have a wonderful evening, and I will see you around town. Good night.